Hello, Nea, it's wonderful to see you. Thanks for having me, how are you? Um, really, really good. Um, you're back in the old country on the other side of, of the Atlantic. I'm here in, in the US. It's wonderful to connect with you again. A lot going on. Um, I wanted to, if I may, talk to you a little bit about, I mean, obviously you are someone who was, you were born in Iran, but you might say you were born in Iran, but you're made in Britain. Um, yes. I would love your perspective on a story that's been in the news recently, and that is to do with uh, Nazanin Ratcliffe, uh, yes. a, a dual um, Anglo-Iranian national. Like you, she was born in, I think you were born in Tehran, she was born in Tehran too. Yep. Um, tell us a little bit about this story. She, she was, she was um, detained for six years by the Iranian regime, yep. and she was just let out some might say in exchange for $400 million of uh, yep. hostage money. Sorry, I shouldn't say hostage money. Debt <laughs> that the UK, UK government allegedly owed. Uh, tell yep. us a little bit about it. What's your, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, firstly, um, people have made it so black and white um, they, because the, it's all about headlines these days. This is a new age of, uh, because of uh, access to information has gone too far, uh, people are becoming patient, uh, impatient. So they don't even actually decide to do like, uh, research or they just read headlines and um, a lot of people assume that uh, instantly within the last six years the Tory government owed uh, Iran 400 million pounds and they, they they basically decided to keep her until they get their money back that's basically the story a lot of people uh, unfortunately uh, think of in reality this is obviously back in the 70s uh, uh, during the Shah's uh, regime uh, the, there was a deal between obviously the UK and Iran uh, for some tanks and stuff and uh, obviously post-revolution uh, that deal to fell through and uh, Iran uh, from day one they've been wanting to kind of go after this money and also it's not just uh, this deal the number of other deals with America as well the Ayatollahs have... wanted the Ayatollahs wanted to get the Shah's money back but but kind of why why are we giving it to them it's kind of crazy that's the thing. Isn't it? What I what I said that you know apparently it's controversial, but because only because no one else had been brave enough to say or didn't really know the line is that unlike other revolutions, this is a very specific revolution in 1979. This is a new country. This country didn't exist before. Before 1979, the imp imperial state of Persia or Iran, uh, legally, constitutionally, not just name wise, everything mm -hmm. was complete, and border and everything else was a, a completely different country. Because the reason I say this is because after 79, uh, the Islamic Republic, uh, the so-called Islamic Repub Republic, um, decided to completely, it was their choice saying, this is a completely new country. We're starting from scratch. So if it's a new country, then that deal in the 70s was not with you. It was with a different <laughs> government, a different country. Whether or not, whatever the rights and wrongs of what happened in the 70s, I mean, two things have happened in the past week. The British government <clears throat> has handed over something like $400 million to the Tehran yep. regime. Yep. And the Tehran regime has handed over an Anglo-Iranian national. It kind of looks like a hostage swap, doesn't it? It is. I, from their perspective, that's how they see it, the Iranians. Uh, they, they say, well, yeah, it's hostage money. Um, and you know, it's, it's their business. They're gangsters. And, and if it were Nazanin, it would be someone else. And they have, they've been doing this so many times. It's actually started the trend in America. It's kind of it's kind of shocking, though, that uh, the British government has actually given in to hostage taking. This is there's no other way of looking at it, really, is that? I mean, to be fair, um, they done they did so well in terms of being patient until now um, over the last few years that they tried to avoid it. Um, the peer pressure, the media uh, kind of game on it went too far that they were like, well, we, we, we can't really get away with it now. But let's just give it and say humanitarian aid. <laughs> yeah, sure. Iran is going to use that for. I don't know, pick and mix uh, shops. Uh, but they're, 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 aid to Hamas, or goodness knows what thuggish organizations they give it to. The yeah. problem I have with the left is that they say we fund uh, bad regimes like Saudi and all these guys and fund arms to Ukraine. So you're fine with funding Iran because uh, it's not their money anymore. And, and also the problem I have is that actually um, Obama and Biden started this trend after the... Uh, the yeah, go on. Now, Nazanin Ratcliffe comes back after six years in, in, kind of in Tehran. Now, I can imagine anyone will be a little bit bitter about having been locked up in Tehran for six years. But she comes back and she doesn't exactly express huge, overwhelming gratitude towards the government that's just ponied up 400 million for her. Does she? Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, a lot of us saw a press conference yesterday where she sat down and um, 
Uh, she instantly tried to uh, attack and slam the UK uh, foreign office, foreign secretaries and governments uh, for saying, you, you, you know, you, you should have saved me six years ago. It's not just the lack of gratitude. That's the problem I have. It's the, the lack of blame for the other side. And it, it, this, this might be bias, of course, but anyway, at least I can play my card for once. Even though I'm a socialist, I don't really play identity cards. I um, obviously I was born there and I went through some troubles and I know that I, I you know, advise don't go back. You know, you, you know, I'll be in prison instantly. My mom's life was miserable until Britain saved her. And she's very grateful for that. Uh, the problem I have with her is that uh, she, she's uh, not only not even saying thank you. It's not even the thank you part of it is that who is the primary uh, kind of the accusers who should be blamed for everything? It's the Iranian regime not the UK government. And I'm not just saying that saying, oh, well, you, you weren't born in the UK, so you, sh you should have like, you, you're lesser. It's not even that. It's, it's, it, it, the primary blamers should be the Iranian regime. Here's, here's a broader point. I mean, we're both immigrants. I'm an immigrant here in America. I wasn't born in America. Yeah. I've had the good fortune to be able to come to America, albeit in middle age. Um, you um, migrated to the UK, I think when you were really quite young. Yep. Not a day goes by when I don't look around me and say, thank goodness I'm in the United States. What a privilege and honor it is to be in this amazing country. And in fact, I bore my American friends by telling them how wonderful their country is. Um, I, 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 I'm, I, I find it difficult sometimes to, to not express my enthusiasm for my host country. I've listened to you express so much appreciation of your adopted country, Britain. Why don't we hear more of this? Why don't why don't people why why don't why why don't people who come to the UK express this affection for the, for the country? Um, why don't people who come to America express this yeah. affection for America? I mean, no one has to make the move. I mean, mostly it's, it's uh, genetics and personalities. Anyway, you can't really change them. It's, it's inside them. But a lot of times, experience matters too. Not to make it black and white, but for example, when my mom uh, says, uh, "You said it uh, in, in a sense that um, uh, made in Iran, uh, no, born in Iran, or was it uh, made made by Britain? Born in Iran, it? made in Britain." my mom said it differently when i was a kid here she said uh, we were the brits who were born somewhere else uh, and uh, they, they, whereas they, they, not to make it black and white but when people like my mom obviously went through a lot of hardship to get here they will be more grateful compared to uh, nazani who moved here uh, legally to study and uh, then stayed because you know obviously she, she found her husband uh, not that because she didn't experience hardship that she doesn't know but it, 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 she, 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 some people because of the personalities they would appreciate less and they should appreciate more but because they don't they take it for granted they keep freedom and democracy and these are things for granted uh, until they actually experience how now ukrainians uh, for example they, they actually appreciate their freedom even more than before it's interesting we we kind of i've just naturally assumed that you know iran's run by these tyrants and they're kind of just it's the way it is do you think there's going to come a time when the regime in Tehran looks as fragile as the strong man in Russia looks? Do you, do you think there'll come a time when actually young Iranians will just say, do you know enough of being told what I should wear, what headscarves I should have, how I should live my life? Do, do you think that moment will come? Well, in terms of the, the, the everyday rebellions and, you know, don't tell me what to do and stuff, that's already happened because the Iranian regime as, as a dictatorship, they've, uh, they've done their studies in the past and they know how to manipulate so they don't they don't not to go too far too quickly like north korea uh, so they they essentially are going to turn a blind eye there's a lot of times right now in iran people are just not really wearing their headscarves or anything like that the, the government don't really care much and it's kind of like semi-oppression sort of thing on a daily basis to avoid an actual uprising but the domino effect is going to happen anyway because if um, if or when putin goes down that's the biggest backer of the iranian regime then iran will become weaker and then, of course, if you get rid of the Iranian regime, there is a massive opportunity now going forward for a, a, an actual... It, it, it will be a cleaner revolution, but it has to be, unfortunately, a bit bloody. Uh, we can't really get involved from the West uh, initially, but they, what they want at the end, the demand that they have is a constitutional referendum. Uh, so that's when the West could get involved and the United Nations, which I don't really respect, have any respect for, to get in there, the international community to kind of monitor uh, the, the the fair referendum and then go from there but, but you know that's you know the years go you know, from now I, uh, when 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 dealing with tyrants whether they're in tehran <laughs> or, or beijing or moscow 
I wonder if, you know, as well as supplying, you know, in the case of Ukraine material to actually, you know, arm um, groups fighting these tyrants, um, I wonder if actually something that even more important for the West to do is to provide moral support and, you know, to give people living in Tehran and uh, Russia and China and Hong Kong this idea that th there is a better way. The, the Statue of Liberty is not just a quaint symbol from the previous century. It is uh, a, a symbol that life, yeah. that life can be better. And yeah, I, mean, I, I, I was always very moved by the thought that the students in Tiananmen Square built a model of the Statue of Liberty. They called it the goddess of democracy. It was, it was, a, it was a model of the Statue of Liberty. It wasn't Big Ben they were building. It wasn't a replica of the Pyramids of Giza or the Eiffel Tower. It was yeah. a symbol of of universal symbol of of freedom um yep. what, what 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 about um russia and and ukraine i mean i remember not that long ago being told that uh national identity was outdated that um supranationalism was the way forward it seems to me that actually it's the supranational institutions that are really ill-equipped to deal with the world as it is um, the yeah. EU has been monumentally useless in its response to Putin. In fact, you could say its foolishness on energy policy has aided and abetted his geopolitical bullying. Um, the UN, nowhere to be seen. Yeah. Um, but a group of plucky Ukrainians who are not going to take any nonsense from anyone, armed with a few American-made and British-made and Swedish-made weapons, seem to, be, seem to be doing a pretty good job. What do you think oh, this yeah. says about national self-determination? I mean, that's the thing. I mean, um, I, I could see some similarities between the, uh, the Iranians and the Ukrainians, but when the, when the time comes, uh, so Iranians, a lot of people say, oh, you've been attempting at these like protests and uprising hasn't gotten anywhere. But when the time comes and if like things get worse, like a civil war situation or whatever, then you would actually see the same power and self-determination because it's all about that. And you said that it's support for, you know, whether Ukrainians when it comes to arming them, but or in Iran, moral support matters because right now in Iran, they are carrying posters of Trump saying bring back Trump and uh, people in the West are confused saying uh, are people in Iran racist no because they're, 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 they've they been let down by the Democrats by Obama by Biden by so, these people so, many so times. you're saying you're saying that people in Iran the land yeah. you were born in yeah. are brandishing pictures of an American president as a yeah. symbol of resistance to their own regime yeah, they're, they're using uh, his pictures, uh, not saying come and save us, not in the sense that come and bomb the country and, you know, kill these guys. No, no, they don't even want that. They don't want full-on intervention. They just want moral support, essentially. And not necessarily just moral support. They just want not really a kind of corrupt hand-in-hand -hand like Obama and the Iranian regime or now Biden and the Iranian regime. Just at least don't get involved with Iran. Don't, don't, don't encourage that behavior of the thuggery. Because uh, 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 as I was saying with the Nazanin stuff, yes, the trend started with uh, Biden and, and Obama. Well, actually, Biden was basically in 2016, just before the election, uh, there was an American hostage and they, the America basically gave money to Iran. And it was instantly after that that they took people like Nazanin. And they was like, OK, let's do the same with Britain. And I'm like, OK, and now we did it with Nazanin. Now they're going to do it again with the French red nationals or German Iranian nationals. And it's going to continue, continue until someone says stop. Because you can't negotiate with terrorists. One other interesting thing about Iran, there was this talk of a, 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 a nuclear deal. Iran's trying to build a bomb. And yeah. I think Obama and uh, the previous um, administration in America had tried to negotiate so that they were going to pretend that they weren't building the bomb in return for getting large amounts of cash. Yeah, That didn't entirely work because they seem to have just carried on building the bomb. Um, it now seems that this deal's back on the table. Um, not only are the Brits just handed over $400 million, it now seems that the Biden administration is lining up to let the Mullahs basically make a nuke. Yes, and uh, it, it, the problem with that is that with or without a deal, Iran um, are building anyway, and it's just about the... It was People thought it was at least about the pace. Obama thought, well, at least we could just bring down the pace. Yeah, publicly... The things that we know in terms of assessing the, the situation, the, the, the nuclear plants, yeah, but they have so many hidden underground ones. And mm -hmm. uh, the, the Israel actually um, exposed that a few years ago. Uh, and Netanyahu actually did the presentation and said, we've discovered all this. No one's listening to us. The Americans are not listening to us. The UN is not listening to us. And we've discovered all these secret hidden ones. They are already building it anyway. 
Uh, but so with or without deal, doesn't change anything in that sense. But with a deal, the problem with that is that you're actually uh, giving more money to them. And uh, the, so the, it's all about the, the, the Iranian regime is all about how long it will last. It's basically drowning. And uh, when you do these deals, you just basically give them a bit of a bit you of support. To bring them. Yeah, exactly. So you just, it, they're terminally ill, the regime. So you just stop, just just uh, pl pl unplug it <laughs> and just let, let them go because they, they, that's what the Iranians are really angry about, the Iranian people. Uh, they, that went over the West, keep extending the life of the Iranian regime. So just let them drown. Now, there have been a couple of other things about the Biden administration here in the States that are a little bit deja vu. I don't just mean the resurrection of the Iran deal. At times, it's kind of vaguely reminiscent of sort of the late 70s. You've got, you've got massive inflation, you know, gas prices, grocery prices are rising really fast. I've been in the States a, a little over a year now. And I think back to what I was paying for everyday things when I first arrived compared to now. Um, you know, a lot of things are very significantly higher in price. In, in effect, the dollar has been, it's lost value. Um, one of the things that I was most struck by when I first arrived here is that the new administration had just given everyone free money. They, they basically sent a check to every single American taxpayer, giving yeah. them several thousand dollars. Well, guess what? Um, you give everyone lots of money and the money will buy less people will yes. just put their prices up and when we, the we money are... disappears yeah people would say oh i've lost so now i need you know you can when you lose money even if it's free you feel the pain more <laughs> so yeah. uh, so they don't, they don't whether it's like by handouts or printing money none of this is it, sometimes it's short-term solution long-term problem but these things are even a short-term problem uh, and biden is actually going to start like to ruin america which means when you ruin america you ruin the world and uh, now they're blaming on Putin. They're blaming they're blaming Putin for the spike in energy prices. And yet the administration, before Putin. <laughs> but, but the, the administration has deliberately made it more expensive to find and extract and burn fossil fuel. I mean, they 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 shut down the Keystone pipeline. They they've deliberately made it harder for businesses in America to generate energy using fossil fuel. And and now they're blaming Putin for the fact that fossil fuel is more expensive. It's 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 extraordinary. Yeah, unless you say that uh, the the Ukraine war started you know a year and a half ago, uh, you can't really blame it on the, the war because uh, not only in terms of the sh shutting down operations, but also printing money, but also the inflation going up and just the mismanagement of the, the whole budget. Uh, this was always going to happen. Yeah, of course you might say that the 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 initial shock. Uh, with the Ukraine war kind of accelerated it for like, you know, a few days, but that was always going to happen. If not a few days, it would have happened next month. Uh, and this is the kind of the biggest issue that we have. And right now, I think people are waking up. It, it, some things are changing, uh, whether it's because when uh, political issues, economic, boring topics that, you know, for a lot of people are not nerdy, they don't really care about, when it hits their pockets and like everyday spending, that's when they wake up, like uh, 79 with Margaret Thatcher, and now uh, with the fact that we are now able to finally talk about nuclear energy and fracking. Until yesterday, we weren't allowed to talk about that, but now we say, yeah, let's actually discover that. Let's explore that option. <laughs> so the, the, the Biden administration, it's not just um, creating inflation with its monetary mismanagement. It's not just generating more expensive energy through its um, uh, net zero obsession. It, yeah. it, it, rather like Jimmy Carter, it also, it seems to have this horrible model in terms of foreign policy. Um, initially, when I saw those scenes from Kabul, the withdrawal from Afghanistan, my assumption was that, you know, what the administration is doing is pivoting to, to focus mainly on, on dealing with China. It, it, yeah. it, it, um, and, and, and it may yet be doing that. But unlike in the 1970s, um, Biden doesn't have the inevitability of the US dollar being the global reserve currency. In fact, you could say that what we're beginning to see is the end of the dollar as the global reserve currency. And I, I, I think this, this ought to be profoundly worrying throughout the West, not just in America, but in, in the UK and Western Europe. If, if the United States dollar ceases to be the world's reserve currency, the, the, yeah. tax, the tax Americana is seriously under 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 pressure from from china and 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 russia and others 
Yeah, for a lot of uh, people like me who uh, been uh, you know, talking about the pre-dollar days and you know, in terms of uh, maybe we could have uh, made some other changes post-gold standards instead of going with the kind of centralizing and everything on dollar. The problem is that even people like me, right now, if dollar goes down, then we worry. We're like, So what's the alternative? Well, are we going to be basically over time agreeing that uh, China is going to be the financial superpower and political superpower, whether it's going to be based on their currency or some sort of new currency or some sort of union currency or some sort of fake centralized cryptocurrency that's going to be controlled by countries like China. Uh, if, if Russia goes down, the credibility of it, uh, the dollar goes down, the credibility of, uh, of it, then, then we don't really know exactly how, not just the West, but the whole world as we know it, how it's going to actually survive. And it's not just the fault of uh, China's and it's not just the fault of people like Biden. It's also the fault of uh, the complacency in the West by creating your concepts of uh, the EU and the World Economic Forum in terms of the getting uh, everything to become centralized, getting uh, believing that CEOs are so uh, wise uh, and all the uh, politicians, presidents, prime ministers, that if you get them in a room, then they could come up with solutions for the whole world. These are the people who create their problems. <laughs> I know, the kind of people who go to that international summit at Davos every year, it's about, it happens about this time every year, actually. Yeah. They're the kind of people who preside over endless faddish yeah. folly and stupidity. These are the guys yeah. who thought that low interest rates were the solution to yeah. um, economics and that would make us, they presided over the banking boom and bust. These are the guys who thought that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac could um, defy the laws of um market economics in the US housing market creating the subprime boom and bust. These are the people who thought that, you know, um, history had ended and that the bad guys around the world secretly wanted to become more like America. Um, I, I, I think one of the things that we're starting to recognize is that what you might call sort of rival civilizations to America and, and Britain, the sort of Anglo-American Western model, are Yes, they are at one level a risk. You see China with its economy doing well. And, and, but I, I'm just beginning to slightly change my mind. I, I think that actually provided the West, particularly the Anglo-American um, powers in the West, provided they retain their, the things that make them exceptional, limited government, small states, uh, 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 low regulation, low taxation, yeah. provided they retain that, I don't really see China and, and India and, and Russia and the rest as a as a as a real a, a, a real threat. I, I mean I think we're already starting to see evidence in China of yeah. slowdown because China has kind of abandoned the open free market. Uh, I don't think it was ever really properly free market, but it's become more a sort of um, Communist Corp Party, state, corporatism, state corporatism, and state corporatism, yeah, yeah, and, it's, yeah. And, it's, and it's it's beginning to beginning to slow down as a result. Um, yeah, yeah. It, I, I meant, go ahead. Now, in terms of the answer to your question, in terms of that, the, why the West could still survive because the one fundamental fundamental difference that we have is quite simple, but it's quite um, deep and philosophical. Is that the, the main difference is whether they copy and paste the capitalist model or whether they turn into state um, um, corporatism or whatever. They would never be able to completely, at least for now, uh, take over or replace our values is because mm -hmm. we in the West, uh, we do things not based on collectivism. We're not doing it for the flag or for the, for the, for the, the cultural, the concept of tribe. We, not that we are kind of selfish, but we're doing it for us and then the, the smaller tribe, family and the community, rather than when the, the Chinese uh, their businessman gets rich. They're doing it for China, for the, the, the CCP and the, the, the collective mentality, like Russia as well. They're doing it for Mother Russia. And uh, it depends who your the, the priority is. What are you living for? Uh, are you living uh, for your life or are you living for a, 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 a collective identity of life? And that's the difference between Americanism and Chinism. I was talking to an American audience recently, and there's a lot of concern in America about China and the threat that <clears> China poses. And I said, yeah. actually, I've become a lot more optimistic about America's chances and a lot more pessimistic about China. Yeah. And my reason for that is in the late 1970s, early 1980s, a lot of Americans worried about another Asian power that was yeah. supposedly going to overtake America. And that was Japan. Yes. What I think is so striking is how, for the past 20, 30 years, Japan has been on a holiday from history. It has basically stagnated. It's yep. not really innovated. It's produced not much since the Sony Walkman. 
and it's not really caught the wave of the digital innovation the way that the United States has. And I think maybe the explanation for this is that Japan's not really authentically free market. It's a sort of corporatist model that masquerades yeah. as being Western and free market. And you, you've got massive government subsidy of a small number of privileged businesses. They have huge debts and there's a lot of export subsidy. Isn't that kind of what's beginning to happen in China? And I, I just wonder if China might be the new Japan, if, if China might actually start to get old before China gets rich. I think we're already starting to see signs of, of China slowing down. So you know, I, I remember, you know, if you had been having this conversation 15, 20 years ago, people would have said, you know, look at the, the, the BRICS, the, 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 the rising power, look at Turkey, look at all these, these non-Western countries doing phenomenally well. Well, what about Turkey? I mean, Turkey has basically reverted to its kind of Ottoman yeah. past. It's got a, a, a an mm -hmm. emperor type figure, and it's stagnating, and it's 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 an economic basket case once again. I think you know, so long as the West stays true to the Western model, we don't have anything to worry about. Um, yeah. I think that the threat from non-Western countries, um, weirdly, if they if they if they align themselves with the Western way, they do well. If they don't, I think they fundamentally become weak, like 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 Russia and, and Turkey, yeah. and I think like China will become. Hey, interesting you mentioned Japan, because it's a good example. A bond, some people would say, oh, we have excuses. The, the moment Japan had a chance to come up, China came up. But it's not even just that. There, there are a couple of issues. One is um, countries like Japan, because of the rich culture and the pride, and that's what they, you know, they can empire, they try to take over the world for some reason. I don't know what happened there. <laughs> um, it's because it's still quite difficult to impose, essentially it's imposing a, an anglo a kind of culture of a kind of free freedom to capitalism things like that you could of course we did enough really well post-war to kind of uh, bring south korea and japan to kind of closer to our side in terms of uh, the values and economics and everything else and it worked but because they when they, they are still collectivists and even though we as, as brits we still come from the, the, the country of empire but the, the concept of Britishness and even, even Anglo-Saxons was also never actually about collectivism. Yeah, we had the crown and we had the flag and we were very proud. But again, as I said earlier, it, it wasn't a collective uh, kind of uh, identity. And they, Japan was found, found, found it difficult to believe in kind of that uh, individualism that Ayn Rand was talking yeah, about. It was, it was a taboo. There's a Western notion of individualism, which we take for granted. Um, yeah. But actually, if you dig a little deeper, it has origins in medieval humanism. It may even have some some echo in in the sort of classical Greek Greco Roman. World. Well, they're Persians as well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, but I, I I mean I think I think you know we often assume that values and assumptions and our intellectual framework, which yep. is essentially Western, we often assume that it's universal. Just because you travel to any city in the world and you say this, see the same kind of Hilton hotels and the same brands and the same Western style of clothing, you assume that all the thought processes and the cultural norms are Western. And, and I think one of the really extraordinary things we're starting to see is that that is just not the case. You can have lots of branches of McDonald's in Russia. It, it doesn't mean that you know, Russia is as Western as California or Croydon. Yeah, and I think that, that that's the big, biggest difference. For example, you can um, you can change cultures again. As I said, there are um, a, a lot of things, things that we have here in the West uh, came from something else in the past. Whether partly because of Judeo-Christian values, uh, that post, especially post Enlightenment, which if we think about it, came from the Middle East, uh, and then obviously then Roman Empire and the Vatican and all that. Uh, it's given, even the Vatican and Rome is not on paper should not be completely uh, historically close to us but of course there are obvious links it's including the, the language of, as an um, anglo and uh, so but on the other hand uh, in terms of a sh quick change in a, a kind of mentality that's kind of uh, it's difficult as we said like you know japan and south korea because they, they we never actually turned them into believing in individualism they still they're still very much kind of a collectivism believing kind of you're doing it for your family and everything else you know greed is bad oh it's a taboo so they they become kind of complacent they had a couple of products and industries like you know lg and samsung and then in, in obviously a toyota and in, in, in sony in japan but then they stopped uh, because there was no appetite for okay let's come up with something else let's go with like the american kind of invention kind of mentality let's invent something else and that didn't happen I mean, you, you obviously in the 19th century, you have Japan as a 
um, Asian country that embraces mm -hmm. modernity and yeah. after the Meiji Restoration sort of takes off economically. Right. What is really, I think, quite striking is that the next wave of takeoff in Asia mm. is really post Second World War, and it's four relatively small mm. uh, countries of uh, South Korea, Hong Kong, Singapore, and Taiwan. And what's significant, I think, about all four of those is that to some extent, all four of them are in effect Western protectorates of some kind, um, yeah. or they have some kind of Definitely. accidental, some sort of residual link like Hong yeah. Kong. Yeah. Um, or, and, and I think that gave those four um, Asian um, economies access to Western capital, know-how. It put them under the protective umbrella of, of the West so that, you know, Hong Kong didn't get gobbled up by its neighbor, well, until rather recently. Um, Singapore, um, its neighbors tried to gobble it up, but the Brits stopped it. Um, Taiwan and South Korea weren't gobbled up by their more aggressive neighbors because of American um, military might. Um, I, 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 I reckon that 20, 30 years ago, it looked as if some of the Asian giants, rather than those four small countries, were beginning to, to take off, you know, India and Indonesia. And I, I just, I do just rather wonder, though, if, if China might throw a, a, a bit of a spanner in the works and this story of takeoff and growth, if China starts to try and create a Chinese sphere of influence, the way it seems intent on creating. Yeah. I'm not sure that's going to be. I'm not sure that's going to be a, a great story for for, yeah. for development anywhere. Um, no, no. Least... Yeah, that's true. I mean, to be fair, it's, uh, we keep talking about like uh, Americans and China. It's actually uh, it's, it's still the kind of uh, the Anglo sphere. That is the, the British kind of identity versus China, because America was basically post us. Uh, so uh, the, the difference is. Weird analogy I always use is that uh, the, the the Western side, the, the British capitalist side, and which we created in America, we are the Godfather of the movie. You know, you go take it slowly, and you actually be patient. China is Scarface. You know, they they take kind of they, <laughs> to say hello to my little friend, and they're in a rush. They got to the top, but that also means you reach the peak, and the fall could be bad. And then then they're gonna have a panic attack, and they're gonna kind of go. Oh, crazy. But on, on, <laughs> on a serious note, on a serious note, you know, a, a, a world dominated first by Britain and then with America as a great power has been a pretty benign, pleasant place. You know, a lot of progress has been made. Um, a world that's dominated by China, I don't think, would be a particularly pleasant place for anyone, least of all for China. I think it would be a deeply unpleasant place to live in. That's why it's never going to work. It's never going to work. Uh, it, 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 it's, it, it's those things that would never, and I think even China knows that. China, don't. I don't think they want to uh, kind of conquer the world in terms of, a, a, at least short term, uh, spread uh, the, the kind of ideology in that sense. They just want to own the world. And they, they are the true gangsters, essentially. And uh, and they do need with, uh, without conflicts, with, apart from obviously Taiwan, <laughs> potentially. Now, on a final note, we've, we've, we've covered a lot of ground. Um, a couple of questions about the UK. Um, I, I would be lying if I said I miss the old country right now. Um, it's a beautiful spring morning here in Mississippi. And, uh, Great weather here as well, sunny. And, oh, really? Oh, wonderful, <laughs> oh, wonderful. We have a, we have um, a spring heat wave, yeah. <laughs> fantastic, fantastic. And, and how's Boris doing? How's my, my old mate Boris doing? He's, he's back, uh, he's bouncing. Um, and the thing is, and now I'm talking about it, of course it's not a surprise that he's back, but in is the moment- so and so, isn't he? he yeah, but his enemies, knows, yeah. he's very lucky with his enemies. They shoot themselves in the foot every time. <laughs> the, the kind of, a, the, the precedent's right that uh, not just uh, people like Boris, but also the Tory party, the Tory government and Tory leaders, they don't fall based on scandals or a, a, a kind of an event. And they, mm -hmm. uh, in terms of Tory leadership, uh, the Tory party bringing Tory leaders down, it's always when, it, when the time comes when subconsciously the machine believes that if this person stays, we might lose the next election. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, the Tory government in general also, unlike the, like in America and in all, most countries, when uh, the government uh, don't lose, uh, the, the, the opposition don't win, the government don't kind of lose, uh, in this country, it's actually weirdly enough. If if uh, the government is at any election, is still in a situation where it's not peaceful, happy days like ninety seven. By default, people will end, will end up voting conservative. Uh, so and ever all these elections that Tories have stayed in power, 2015, 17, 19, 
It's not because it's all oh, status quo establishment. It's because at any at all those elections there was a, there was a crisis. Twenty nineteen was Brexit. Twenty seventeen was still Brexit and, and Corbyn. Twenty fifteen was oh we did the deficit a bit well, but it's still not there yet. Yeah. So and the moment that they will lose is when the country is completely secure and stable, and then people you, you're spoiled, saying so people people, people vote left when they feel they can afford it, and actually yeah, when the facts of life reassert themselves, they realise that yeah, Rega they yeah regardless of scandals regardless regardless of corruption, regardless of how many cakes Boris ate at his birthday, people don't really care deep down. They might be outraged. It's a classic, uh, of course, you know, they, they, people watching this uh, and, and your, your stuff in America, um, they know the basic concepts of you know, the, the British kind of uh, gossipy kind of and sense of humor and all that. But it, the whole country is based on gossip. You go to the barbers, you gossip about, oh yeah, did you hear that about Boris? Or did you hear about that Jeremy Corbyn guy, all this and all that? Yeah. People show outrage on the bus, on the train, but in reality, they just show the outrage. They already released the energy. So when they, the next week, they, they vote, they don't really care. <laughs> yeah, and also, I mean, I think a lot of people just think politicians are annoying and politicians, in Boris's case, will try and have their cake and eat it. Uh, um, Literally. That doesn't... <laughs> I know, it's, it's hilarious, isn't it? It's hilarious. <laughs> For years, people have been saying Boris has wanted to have his cake and eat it, and he literally he did that at his birthday party. <laughs> You yeah, I mean, people have low standards. Yeah, people have no expectation of politicians to be morally superior. Yeah. So. <laughs> I have to say, on a serious note, finally, I mean, I, I think Britain has actually played a blinder. We were told that post-Brexit Britain would be isolated, insular. The UK was arming Ukrainians and training Ukrainians since 2016. And it's, it's British, um, those kind of shoulder-held anti-tank weapons, apparently, you know, they, they've been playing their role. Um, Ben yeah. Wallace, the defence minister, insisted over the heads of his officials that we 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 supply arms to the Ukrainians. Um, we yeah. led the way on sanctions. It's it's been it's been you know it's been a pretty you know it's been pretty good. We we've been kind of probably the most uh, pro Ukraine government in Europe, yeah. bar perhaps Poland. Um, so that's yeah. wonderful. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely spot on. Global Britain uh, continues with or without the EU. I remember I remember a few years ago going to a conference in Versailles with a whole bunch of French enarchs who were um, pontificating about how bad Brexit was. And I was there as a kind of token Brexiteer, the sort of house trained Brexiteer. And I remember getting into a conversation about Russia and it became obvious from the conversation that pretty much a, a large chunk of the French enarch establishment is uh, was was pro Russia and thought that it could do some okay. deal with Russia. I mean that is looking pretty pretty stupid. I mean French foreign policy is looking pretty lamentable, and I think Boris is, Boris the supposed clown is looking pretty. Strong. It's wonderful. It's oh, wonderful. What a world we live in. Exactly. <laughs> As a matter, it has been wonderful talking to you. And, Thank you very um, much. Thanks for having me. Let's let's have a catch up again in about another six months or so. Absolutely. See you wonderful. soon. Thank you. Bye.